Six years after the Huffington Post was launched in the United States, it was sold to AOL for $315 million. Ariana Huffington is the founder of the Huffington Post. Her controversial business model extends to decisions about editorial content. Last month, she announced that stories about Donald Trump, the leading Republican presidential candidate, would not feature on the Huffington Post's political pages. Instead, the Trump name only appears in the entertainment section. The feud between them goes way back, fuelled by numerous attacks on Twitter by the billionaire, including one calling Ariana Huffington unattractive and praising her husband for leaving her. Ariana Huffington joined me from her offices in New York. Why Australia? It's a tiny market, certainly in comparison to the United States, about 10 times as small in terms of population. Oh, we cannot be a serious global player without being in Australia. Uh, Australia was always on the map from day one. Uh, it's going to be our 15th market. Um, I was there uh, talking to different possible partners a few months ago. We are delighted to be partnering with Fairfax and uh, very excited to be in Australia. It's, um, it's such a vibrant country um, so with so many amazing people that I hope we're going to be blogging on the Huffington Post. So many great stories to cover. Um, we are going to, for example, be covering exhaustively uh, what's happening in Australia right now around this whole debate of work-life balance, uh, our addiction to technology, um, how we bring up children, all these big global issues which are also playing out in a big way in Australia at the moment. What do you hope to achieve in Australia? Well, we hope to be a place uh, where uh, people can write or cross-post what they're already writing on any topic and where vibrant conversations can take place, whether it's on the way we live our lives and the change that technology has brought to that, or gay marriage, which I know is a hot topic in Australia at the moment, um, or the latest political issue, or the latest recipes. I mean, we want to cover everything that interests people, from the most important political issues um, to the most uh, uh, lively um, lifestyle issues. And we want to do it as we're doing it everywhere in two ways, you know, both through our own journalists and uh, through offering a distribution platform to um, everybody who lives in Australia. And I must say, another thing that I want to stress is that uh, because all the content by all our editions is available to our uh, Australian editors, it means that they will have access to everything every anyone is producing in our other 14 editions. And there are so many issues that touch all of us across the world, which is going to make the content of Half House Australia um, really topical and, uh, and really rich. How many staff do you intend to employ here? 30, we start with 30. But all 850 um, full-time Half-Post employees um, are going to, in a sense, be working for Half-Post Australia. Uh, because a lot of these issues that I mentioned, plus another big editorial initiative that we have, which we call What is Working, which is our effort to reimagine journalism, to focus on solutions, to focus on what is working, and not just on all the crises and the problems. Uh, we are hoping to create copycat solutions instead of only copycat crimes. All that is going to be available um, to our Australian editors to, um, to put in the Australian context. You recently spoke of an aspiration for one million contributors to Huffington Post. Is that still your ambition? And how many of them do you expect to be writing for you here in Australia? Oh, I hope. Uh, I hope a lot of them because, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't have to be original to us. You know, if somebody is producing something for their own blog or for, or for Facebook, they can cross-post on the Huffington Post and get a much wider distribution. We now have 214 million unique visitors around the world. And 
part of what we're doing is translating the best content in all the other editions. And the thing that is really important to us is to stress the fact that our blogging platform has no hierarchy. So recently you could have had, for example, a post by Francois Hollande, the president of France, next to a post by a homeless teenager who's something interesting to say. In fact, we did have a homeless teenager who wrote an interesting blog on the Huffington Post, and the Harvard admissions office happened to read it and offered him a place at Harvard, and he's now in his third year there. We love that kind of um, platform that the Internet makes possible, which uh, can give a voice to people who otherwise would not have a voice, and also serve as talent that otherwise might remain um, unknown to us. In 2012, the Huffington Post became the first commercially run digital enterprise to actually win a Pulitzer Prize. I'm curious to know what you think it was about your approach to publishing that saw you manage to so spectacularly rise above the pack of establishment newspapers and magazines. Well, we believed from the beginning that we wanted to be the best of the old and the best of the new. Uh, we revere traditional journalism and all that it stands for in terms of fairness, accuracy, fact-checking. These are values that very often are overlooked in the Internet age, and we wanted to put them at the front and center of everything we did. And that meant hiring great journalists, giving them the time to develop stories, um, the story that you mentioned that won a Pulitzer, which was a nine-part series uh, on the lives of returning vets, took our military correspondent nine months to, go to, to write. So we wanted to support that kind of journalist, but at the same time uh, make it very, very aligned with the, all the new tools available to us. So we invited vets to tell their stories. We had multimedia around the, uh, the series. We had video, photographs, all, all the sort of infographics that brought the story to life. Explain for us, if you will, your policy on contributors. How do you decide who does and who doesn't get paid? Well, I think there, there are two very different sets of people. Our full-time staff, um, is, has uh, different uh, responsibilities and different privileges. You know, they have deadlines to meet and they also have salaries and uh, very good benefits. Our contributors uh, can write whenever they want. They may write once a year or they may uh, write every week, but that's up to them. There are no expectations and they only write when they have something that they want to say. And they don't get paid. Yeah, because that's really the reason they're writing is for the distribution. In the same way, you know, I'm here on your show, I'm not being paid. Uh, I'm here because I want to talk about Half of Australia. I want to spread the word. So I'm taking advantage of your platform to talk about Half of Australia. People in Australia can take advantage of our platform to talk about the things that interest them. Your critics argue that your attitude to bloggers devalues journalism, the profession of writing. Surely if it's worth reading, it's worth paying for. Well, I think the people who say that um, really do not understand platforms. I mean, Facebook is a platform. Would anybody say that when you write on Facebook or when I write on Facebook, it devalues writing? Uh, there's been a revolution in the last few years, and one of the ways I express it is by saying that self-expression has become a new source of fulfillment and entertainment for millions of people around the world, and, and that train has left the station. Now, you've written 14 books, and the one you're working on right now is all about sleep. In fact, you talk about sleep as the secret to success. Tell us how you arrived at that epiphany. Well, as I wrote in, in my last book, Thrive, uh, I collapsed from sleep deprivation and exhaustion in 2007. I hit my head on my desk, broke my cheekbone, and that was the beginning of my studying, really, the latest science around the misconception 
that burnout is the way to succeed. This is a collective delusion that uh, millions of people are, are living under. And the truth, as all modern science shows, is that the human system was not designed for 99.9% .9 uptime. We all need downtime, we need sleep, we need time to unplug and recharge. I just came back from 10 days in Greece. And uh, it makes a huge difference when we give ourselves that time. It makes us not just healthier, uh, but more effective at what we do. I note that recent research you commissioned found that a third of the people surveyed slept for less than five hours a night. Yes, it's, it's a real crisis. It's, um, my book is going to be called The Sleep Revolution because the latest science shows the dangers of sleep deprivation. It shows how it affects every disease from diabetes and heart disease to Alzheimer's and, and how it also it affects uh, decision making. And uh, recently here we had a tragic accident where a truck driver who had been up for 26 um, hours, you know, killed um, someone in another car and injured the other passengers. And that was just another reminder um, that it's actually dangerous, both for ourselves and for others, to pretend that we can, uh, we can do without enough sleep. You've now got nap rooms at Huffington Post. How well patronised are they and when did you decide to introduce them? Uh, about um, four and a half years ago and people love them and we, we've introduced a lot of things. We have meditation, breathing and yoga classes. We have free healthy snacks everywhere and we just introduced a new vacation email policy whereby when you go on vacation, you can opt into this um, tool so that if I send you an email, I'll get an email back that you're on vacation, that my email will be deleted and that I should email you again whenever you're back in two weeks and give me a name of somebody I can get in touch with if it's urgent. It makes a big difference not to be receiving emails when you're on vacation. And as you know, this out of office email that people set up is pretty useless because often five minutes later we get an email from the person. Now I want to talk to you about another one of your books called Right is Wrong, how the lunatic fringe hijacked America, shredded the constitution and made us all less safe. At the time you said, and I quote, that the mainstream media have become the best friend of the right by stubbornly clinging to the misguided notion that every major issue has two sides, two valid perspectives and both deserve to be given equal weight. Now, is that an attitude you'll adopt in covering politics here in Australia? We call our coverage at the Huffington Post beyond left and right. Uh, we believe that the major issues of our time, whether it's climate change, growing inequalities, uh, or any other problem you want to bring up, um, does not really have um, an easy, productive way to see it in right-left terms. I mean, climate change is not a right-left issue. Growing inequalities is not a right-left issue. We have an enormous amount of people who are conservative, who are worried about stability uh, if these inequalities grow much more. Um, in the same way, issues like the war on drugs is not a left-right issue. And that is for us um, the much more productive way in which to look at the problems and that's how we've been covering everything over the last 10 years. Does that mean at Huffington Post Australia you'll take a firm position on issues like climate change, like asylum seekers and immigration, like same-sex marriage and the war in Iraq? Uh, we take positions that we believe are in the public interest. We, we don't take positions in terms of cheerleading for one particular party or one particular candidate. But definitely we believe that uh, there is a universal agreement among scientists of the reality of climate change, unless it's scientists who are in the pay of uh, oil industries. And in the same way, yes, we are in favor of gay marriage. We consider it a human rights issue. 
Um, we have from day one been opposed to the war in Iraq. Um, we consider it the most tragic foreign policy mistake that America has been involved in and we have certainly been proven right. So yes, we take positions when it comes to the public interest, but we don't take partisan positions. Finally, Arianna Huffington, let's talk about American politics. You've taken a fairly controversial stance on the leading contender for the Republican nomination, Donald Trump. Rather than covering him in the Huffington Post's political pages, you've taken the editorial decision that stories about him should only appear in the entertainment section. Why? Because we don't think he's a serious political candidate. We, we think um, he deserves to be covered in the entertainment sections. I think he's very entertaining. And that's why millions of people flock to hear him. But uh, we don't believe that uh, he's a serious political candidate. Even though he's leading the polls? Well, his numbers are going down. And we also at the Huffington Post don't believe very much in polling. We think that... Uh, um, if you look at the number of candidates who are leading at different times in different election cycles, you don't even remember them anymore. Michelle Bachmann was leading at one point um, in the last cycle. Um, we had uh, multiple candidates who have disappeared without trace who are leading. You know, increasingly, Polls need to be taken with a very large grain of salt. You know, more and more people refuse to participate in polling. Response rates are going down um, every year. And there are many, many problems with polling. I think it's one of the problems with modern journalism, that they take polls so seriously. Often they lead um, coverage. It's a kind of lazy journalism. And at the Huffington Post, um, we are going to do something similar now, but in the last election cycle, we showed and presented polls um, in the same space as um, astrological science. We called it half astrology. So I think it's a shame that we waste so much energy and time as journalists covering polls. But there's no question he has a strong following. Just last week at a rally in Michigan, he attracted a crowd of some 3,000 people who came out to hear him speak. And as far as the first Republican contenders debate, that attracted a cable viewing audience of some 24 million people, the biggest audience in the history of cable television, rivalling the biggest of football matches. You have to admit, that had a lot to do with the fact that Donald Trump was on that stage. Absolutely. It had a lot to do with Donald Trump because entertainment will always attract uh, larger audiences than politics, which simply validates the Huffington Post decision to cover him as an entertainer. I'm also keen to hear your view on Donald Trump's attitude to women, specifically most recently to Megyn Kelly, the Fox News presenter who questioned him on the night of the debate. Because, of course, you've also been a target of his abuse. He's called you a dog and said you were unattractive. When he's been challenged about these insulting comments, he says people need to stop being so politically correct. Well, I thought what he said about Megyn Kelly and uh, uh, implying that she was menstruating and that's why she was that was um, really a completely over-the-top statement. Specifically, though, he's complained about what he sees as America's obsession with political correctness. What do you say to that? Well, we covered it in entertainment. OK, then, Arianna Huffington, we appreciate the time you've taken to speak to Late Line tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.